Well, colleagues, uh, welcome back uh, to this session. Uh, what gathers us right now is uh, the Andrew Crockett uh, Memorial Lecture. Uh, as you know, this is a bi biannual uh, event we held here uh, at the BIS since 2013. And uh, precisely the objective of it is to commemorate Sir, Sir Andrew Crockett who was our general manager from 1994 and 2003. And as you know, Andrew was a, a great a, a figure for many of us in central banking. And in a way, he was one of the pioneers in many financial stability related issues, in particular, uh, the interaction of fiscal and monetary policy. And uh, well, uh, even since uh, he, he, he left the BIS, we still have been engaged in those topics and we will probably forever be engaged in those topics because it's very difficult to square that equation. And that's why constantly we need uh, uh, food for thought. We need the deep reflections about uh, the issue at hand, relationship between fiscal and monetary policy. You heard us, uh, uh, the VIS uh, management uh, address the, the issue. Uh, but uh, to continue the discussion, we have the privilege of having with us uh, uh, in this year's uh, Andrew Crockett, Crockett uh, lecture, uh, Jeremy Stein, uh, very well known uh, to all of us. Uh, not only because he's a very distinguished uh, economist, but also he's no stranger to the central banking community, having served as Fed governor from 2012 to 2014. Uh, Jeremy has a unique talent to bring the rigorous tools to cutting edge policy issues, as he will show us today in his talk that is uh, when he will talk about, about monetary policy when the central bank shapes financial market uh, sentiment. So the way we will organize the session is that uh, Jeremy will first take the floor and present uh, his research to us. Immediately after uh, Jeremy's speech, we will have a panel to discuss the main issues raised uh, by, by Jeremy. And we'll start with Christine, then with Amir, and then John Williams, who will accompany us uh, virtually. And uh, then uh, I'll give the chance to, to Jeremy to, to react. And then I will open the floor for Q&A. So without further ado, uh, let me now give the floor to Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Augustine. Thank you very much. And it's a great honor uh, to be invited to give the Andrew Crockett Memorial uh, talk and to be a great pleasure to be with all of you. So what I thought I would do is talk about some recent work uh, that's joint with Anil Kashyap uh, at the University of Chicago. And uh, our work takes up a set of issues uh, as Augustine uh, was referring, that Sir Andrew and many of his BIS colleagues, um, including notably Claudio Barrio, were among the first and most articulate to, uh, to bring to our attention. So I hope you'll see as the talk goes on the connection to that work um, and the debt that, that, that we owe to them. Um, so what I thought I'd try to do is two things. One is describe an increasingly well-documented, I think, and well-understood view of how monetary policy works, just the transmission of monetary policy, namely that it works in part by affecting uh, what you might call risk appetite or, or sentiment. I think that's the sort of more uncontroversial uh, part of the talk. And then ask, well, if you accept that, that that's how monetary policy works, um, how might you think differently about the conduct of policy and some of the trade-offs that are, that are embodied? So that's, that's the plan of attack. Um, so how does monetary policy work? Let me just sort of set up the straw man very quickly. Uh, you know, the standard view that's in the textbooks, that's, in, that's at the core of the models that most central banks use, 
really is focused on safe rates of interest. So the real simple story, the central bank sets the overnight policy rate, prices are sticky, that's the real rate. If there's an expectations hypothesis of the term structure and rate changes are persistent, that propagates out the yield curve. And you can think, again, this is a little fast and loose, but you can think that policy works by basically affecting the five and 10 year government bond rate, right? And then the usual stuff happens, happens from there. And the point I just wanted to make is that that conventional view is largely silent on investor attitudes towards risk and on risk taking. You, I mean, it would be an oversimplification, um, but that view basically you can think of risk premia as being constant or not part of the story. In spite of the fact that of course when central bankers in the world talk about policy, they talk an awful lot about financial conditions and about their impact on financial conditions. And basically what I'm gonna be doing is embracing that view and then asking, you know, but if really financial conditions matter so much, does it change sort of some of the textbook, some of the textbook prescriptions? Okay, so, you know, an emerging view, and this won't surprise any of you, um, but, you know, the evidence on this, um, I think this has been talked about for a while. Uh, actually, I think Claudia, one of the first papers, Raghu Rajan talked about this at Jackson Hole many years ago. Um, an emerging view is that monetary policy in part works by when, you, when, when rates are lower, it kicks off a variety of incentives for people to take more risk. Um, so one that's sort of near and dear to my heart, I sit on the board of our endowment at Harvard, and for many years we had a fixed target. You know, the university wanted 5% payout every year, so we got it in our heads that we should have a target of earning a 5% real return. Well, one of the things that does is if risk premia go down and real rates go down, harder to get the 5% return, one way you can do it is by taking more risk. Now maybe it's a coincidence, but if you look at Harvard and many of our peers over the years, the fraction of our portfolio allocated to alternatives, uh, to, to private equity, all that stuff has, has gone up, right? You can think of this as a pension fund. You can think of this as one of the forces acting on Silicon Valley Bank, uh, get a lot of deposits in. If the safe rate, short rate was 4%, maybe you just put it in short-term bills. If the safe short rate is zero, uh, you gotta cover your costs. Maybe you go out either the credit or the, or the duration spectrum, okay? So I think that's, a, that's an emerging view. There's now been a large body of evidence, uh, roughly sort of over the last 10 years, a large body of evidence that says, if you just, and this, this, this is sort of the easier kind of empirical work to do, to say, let's look at a, an innovation to monetary policy. A lot of this you can just do by looking at what happens in markets in the hours or days after an FOMC or other central bank announcement. Um, you see the risk premiums on a wide range of assets moving. So Fed easing, central bank easing, stock market goes up, it looks like 80% of that is not expected future earnings but a lower discount rate. Treasury term premia, we all know that they're affected by QE. They also seem to be quite powerfully affected by plain vanilla, just interest rate changes. Credit spreads, similarly easing of monetary policy, narrows credit spreads. Uh, if you look at bank lending terms, this is a longer horizon endeavor, but you'll see that easier monetary policy corresponds to banks moving out the risk spectrum and flattening essentially the slope of how much compensation they ask for um, as a function of risk, okay? And that sort of fits, that, that, you know, one way to think about that again is through this risk, um, this sort of risk incentive uh, channel, okay? So I, 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 I suppose that there's probably not too much disagreement that those mechanisms are at place. I said this is the sort of un, uncontroversial, I guess I'm done with the, the uncontroversial part. Um, <laughs> You know, in the same symposium that we had our paper in, Ben Bernanke and some of his co-authors wrote a paper, and their review of this evidence, almost verbatim the same as ours. I mean, I think, you know, these are the studies that are pretty easy to, to interpret. There's not a lot of econometric complication. So I think Ben and I were sort of in agreement up till now. Okay, uh, so let's, let's move on. Um, oh yeah, this is just a picture. This is just one way of seeing this. What I wanted you to see in this picture is that do, during the QE era, between the two uh, dashed lines, this was a period during which the stock market was booming, term premia were generally low or negative, and bank lending terms were very easy. So that's just, it's just uh, uh, another way of saying the same thing. Okay, here's where it gets harder. So I've told you that the engine works a little bit differently. Does that mean you should drive the car any differently? Um, 
you, know, you might just say, oh, this is all good, uh, especially if we're near the zero lower bound. The fact that we can move not only safe rates of interest but financial conditions just means that policy has more kick. That means we can get kind of more bang for the buck out of a given unit of funds rate change. That's helpful. Okay, now here, here comes, I guess, the trade-off I'd like to uh, put on the table is that the increased risk-taking, the kind of elevated asset prices, the, the increased leverage, all of that also may raise the odds of some kind of a painful reversal at some point down the road. Uh, I'm going to call this the credit bites back mechanism. This is an homage to a very uh, uh, a seminal paper by uh, Shularik and Taylor that had that in, in the title. But the evidence I'm going to try and show you now is that if you look at what happens after periods of rapid credit growth, compressed risk premia, there seems to be, and this is, requires a little bit more econometrics, so it's not going to be as unambiguous, but there seems to be an elevated risk of either a financial crisis or, or a recession. Okay, and if that's true, then you gotta, you gotta make, a, you get, there's a, there's a trade-off to be made. So, you know, obviously we're all very familiar with inflation versus unemployment. This is a different one. This is like unemployment today versus unemployment in the future. You may be able to do better on your unemployment mandate today, but if you're doing that in part by really stoking financial conditions, there's a risk that you may do worse uh, in the future and there's, there's, there's a balance to be struck. All right, um, so I'll give you a little bit um, of some of the evidence here, talk very briefly about regulation, and then kind of my bottom line is at, at, the, uh, at the serious risk of self-immolation, I'm gonna try to show you three equations. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, so what's the evidence? And again, this is evidence, this is sort of post-GFC uh, line of work. Um, if you look and hear the sacrifice you have to make is because we're looking at things that take several years to play out. You can't do these nice, simple event studies. You're gonna to have to put together long panels of data, okay? That raises the risk that you're looking at environments and institutional arrangements. You know, Portugal 100 years ago may not be all that relevant. Okay, so this is suggestive and you're gonna to have to interpret it to some degree through the filter of your own um, uh, way of thinking about stuff. But what you see, if you look at sort of long historical samples, is first of all, if I just tell you credit has been growing rapidly. So bank lending, for example, has been growing rapidly. It's good news for the next couple of quarters. It's bad news in the sense of an elevated uh, risk of a financial crisis at something like a three to five year horizon. So that's fact number one. Quantity, quantity information on credit growth has, has that thing. Seems to be that there is also, in addition, important ind independent information, not only in the quantity, but in some sense in the pricing of credit. So if I tell you, not only is credit growing, but credit spreads are unusually narrow, and the fraction of credit going to lower qu credit quality firms is elevated, think of like the share of junk bonds in, in total issuance, that's also pessimistic at a two to three year horizon. And you can put these together. So in other words, the really worrisome configuration is when you have both a big increase in credit quantity at the same time that it's getting cheap, right? Which, you know, you think about this, you never know if it's supply or demand moving around. This suggests that it's credit supply because there's more and it's cheaper. So when you see things that look like kind of a boom in credit supply, that seems to have a, a worrisome uh, downside. So I'm not gonna go through all the evidence. I'll just show you a few a few uh, uh, select studies. So this is one of the early ones uh, that got a lot of attention. This is Shalarik and Taylor. Um, they have a panel, again, you know, uh, interpret this accordingly. This is 14 developed countries, 1870 uh, to roughly the present, okay? And what they've done is these, these different one, two, three, four, five are quintiles of credit growth, essentially bank loans to GDP over the pre preceding five years. And then the vertical axis is probability of a financial crisis. So what this is telling you is as you move from the low credit quality, uh, I'm sorry, low credit growth quintile to the high credit growth quintile, the, uh, the probability of a financial crisis at a roughly five year horizon goes from something like 2% to something like 8%. So just this is a pretty naive cut. And again, it's a whole mishmash of stuff, but you know, more credit growth, elevated probability of a crisis. I mean, one thing, you know, is this at the level of policy relevant? Not clear. I mean, you're going from 2% to 8%. It's not like, 
overwhelming, you know, we're about to, you know, the, the world is about to end. There's something there statistically, you might not think it's economically um, overwhelming. All right, I'm gonna skip, this is another one, does a similar thing. Doesn't look at crises, looks at sort of changes in GDP. It's a more recent sample, um, broader set of countries, same basic uh, bottom line, faster growth in debt, in this case, household debt, um, poor, uh, you know, uh, less GDP growth going forward, okay? So the, the, the effect doesn't seem to be driven entirely by crises, so to speak, but also by more garden variety kind of uh, business cycle fluctuations. Um, here's some work that I did actually with uh, Egon Zakracek, who's, who's here, and David Lopez Salido when we started when we were all at the Fed together. Here we're looking not at quantity, but at a notion of sentiment, a risk premium. So what we've got along the horizontal axis here is a measure of credit market sentiment. It's essentially, think of it as a linear combination of credit spreads and the fraction of debt issuance that's high yield. So when credit spreads are narrow and there's a lot of high yield, that has tended in prior work to forecast bad returns to credit. We're gonna call that elevated credit market sentiment. And so when credit market sentiment is high, this is just the US, again, you tend to see GDP growth at a three-year-ish horizon being lower, okay? So there's a quantity aspect, there's a price aspect. Let me show you one last study here that tries to put it together. So this is uh, very recent work actually by Robin Greenwood who spoke here the other day and uh, some other uh, uh, Harvard uh, colleagues of mine. What it's doing is basically combining the two. You can think of this as an interaction. It's asking if we have both rapid credit growth and elevated asset prices, what happens? And the way to, uh, maybe I use the pointer here. So the way to look at this is it's a little matrix and so going across here, we have the debt quintile. This is from low debt credit uh, quantity growth to high, and this is from low asset price growth to high. So the middle is kind of normal times. The unconditional probability of a financial crisis in their sample, again, big cross country sample, is about 8%, okay? What's interesting is if you go to this corner here, which is the highest, uh, the fastest growth in the quantity of debt and the most rapid appreciation of asset prices. So you get the price and the quantity thing going. Now the probability of a financial crisis in the next few years goes to 45%. So I wanted to emphasize that as compared to the two to eight. Now you're getting something that if you believe it, and again, lots of different institutional arrangements and lots of different stuff. Now these are magnitudes that start feeling meaningful. And you know, these guys in their, in their paper were very keen to push back. Um, they had some quotes from Bernanke and Geithner and Paulson saying things like, financial crises are largely unpredictable. They're bolts from the blue. All you can do is kind of have high capital and hope for the best. Their pushback, again, if to the extent that you take this seriously, is you know, there's times when it gets more predictable. Of course, there's still, there's still mistakes, but, but we're, we're kind of moving the probabilities around in a, in a relatively um, significant way. Okay, and this is just a graphical depiction of the same thing. Um, it's, the, it's, it's this upper quadrant here where debt growth has been rapid and price appreciation has also been strong. You get a lot of the crises in recent history kind of in this upper, in this upper corner. Okay, so um, that's the argument so far. I've tried to say two things and you can see there's a there's big leap of faith. Okay, I think that, again, the relatively convincing thing is, you know, uh, aggressive monetary policy moves financial conditions. Then there's another piece which says, well, geez, when financial conditions are overly loose, it seems like the, the odds of a crisis or something going wrong are higher. I think there's still a big leap to be made. And in particular, one thing that I haven't shown you is, it's, it, 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 none of this stuff shows you that it's the case that it's those movements in financial conditions that are created by monetary policy that are in fact the dangerous ones. I think it could be bubbles for other reasons that have nothing to do with monetary policy and those are the ones that are problematic and maybe monetary policy is really not much to blame for any of this, right? It could just be investor sentiment sometimes moves and that's problematic but let's not blame monetary policy. So let me show you one more study and I wanna be particularly ginger with this one. Um, I'm showing it to you mainly because it's, it's taking the next logical step. 
It's trying to show you the full transmission of easy monetary policy, puts you in this sort of danger zone, and then you have the bad outcome. Okay, so this is a very recent paper by the same Shularik Taylor team, with, uh, also with Grimm. I want to be ginger. This is a just released paper. Um, there's, again, because you're using these long, long horizons, there's a fair amount of econometrics to kind of, you know, it's not as transparent as some of the other stuff. This hasn't been vetted through the normal process. So I'm just, I just want to sort of show you this in an illustrative way. I think if this is ever to be taken seriously for sort of policymakers, it's going to require quite a bit more, quite a bit more vetting. But what they claim to find is that if you look at periods, again, in this long historical sample, where monetary policy has been easy, which they define as our, as the interest rate being below our star, which they then have to kind of have a model of. But if you look at that, that seems to be followed, again, at a quite low frequency by both overheating of markets and ultimately by bad economic outcomes. So I'll just show you a couple pictures. The first one, this is actually sort of a retrospective. This, this says, if you look at the years before a financial crisis, so the red line here is a financial crisis like the US in 2007, and just ask, what was monetary policy doing in the years before something went bad? It turns out it was easy in the US. And in the whole sample, you tend to see, if you sort of define here's a crisis, let's look backwards, you tend to see monetary policy was easy in the years before a crisis, and uh, credit to GDP was growing rapidly. Okay, The more um, difficult thing to do, um, and again, uh, take this with, you know, with a grain of salt, but the more difficult thing to do is to say, let's essentially do a forecasting exercise and ask ourselves, if we have a period where, let's say, monetary policy has been in the lowest 20% of ease, or the, the top 20% of easiness, so if monetary policy has been easy, let's look at sort of the dynamics of the economy over the following years. Okay, and again, it won't be surprising that in the, in the um, and I'm sorry, and this is probability of a crisis is on the vertical axis. So not surprisingly, in the immediate aftermath of easy monetary policy, it's good, right? And so the probability of a crisis is actually subdued relative to its, to its mean. But if you go out sort of five, six, seven years, there's a higher likelihood of a crisis, OK? Again, this is at least the narrative that one would want to tell if you're telling the story I'm, I'm telling. Okay, so I'm not, I don't mean to say this is the final word, but this is the kind of thing you'd want to think about, right? This would make the point that there is a trade-off because if you do sort of overly easy policy or more easy policy today, you make your, you know, it's literally implicit in the dots being below and above, you make things better for a time, but potentially at the cost of making them worse uh, down the road. All right, uh, I'm not going to keep going. So. Um, you know, the obvious uh, and correct response, I think, is regulation should be the first line of defense against these sorts of financial stability problems. Okay? Absolutely agree. Okay? And nothing I say here should be taken to mean anything other than a great enthusiastic desire to do financial regulation as best as we possibly can. So, you know, more capital, I'm for it. You know, anything else we can do, I'm for it. Whatever lessons we can learn from SVB, absolutely. But you can simultaneously believe that and believe that regulation, while obviously helpful, is far from perfect, right? I mean, look, in the data, we have hundreds of years of financial crises. So maybe guys weren't getting regulation right, and eventually they'll get it right, but they haven't got it right yet. Um, and, you know, um, at least there's some superficial evidence that some of this is monetary policy related. So if you, if, you, if you accept that, then regulation thus far has not shown itself to be capable, while, while helpful, has not shown itself to be capable of fully reining in or fully um, offsetting the incentives that, that the sort of risk-taking dynamic uh, sets off. And I think SVB is interesting in this regard. I mean, on the one hand, there will be some lessons from SVB that we should take to heart in terms of improving capital, liquidity, and all of that. Absolutely. But, you know, we took to heart a lot of lessons uh, 15 years ago and did a lot of useful things, and yet stuff happens. And I think, you know, it would be hubristic to think that whatever we do after SVB, especially, I would say, in a country like in countries that have 
relatively capital markets uh, dominated financial systems where bank regulation doesn't reach well, to think that the regulatory thing in, you know, in the current environment is going to be sufficient uh, to rein in these incentives to me feels a little bit, uh, a little bit much. So then that, that leads us to monetary policy. All right, so here, here I'm going to um, uh, blow myself up. I'm going to try to um, just show you how you can tweak really just quite modestly sort of the most simple textbook thing to sort of incorporate the type of trade-off um, that I have in mind. So let me start with just the standard thing. So this is, this is a very, very boiled down version of kind of macro. Okay, so this is the, the, the top line is an, what's called an IS curve. It just says that output uh, is, you know, sort of like it's steady state level, but then if you have interest rates above R star, that pushes output down, right? So that's just aggregate demand as a function of interest rates. Um, second line says the central bank would like to have, um, oh, so I'm, I'm setting aside inflation here. I'm setting aside inflation because I'm only looking at aggregate demand shocks, so I'm assuming a divine coincidence that if you've basically got um, output where you want it, you'll have inflation where you want it, okay? So I'm saying even in this simple world where there's not the usual inflation output trade-off, there's still a tension uh, intertemporally between output today and tomorrow. So assume the central bank just wants to minimize deviations of output from its uh, ideal level. And in this simple setting, it's just a demand shock. This just says it's easy. Central bank, all it has to do is offset when aggregate demand is too high. You raise rates. When aggregate demand is too low, you, you cut rates. Okay, that's just a, as, a, as a benchmark. All right. So now let me try to bring in the stuff I talked about. Okay. So that amounts to doing two things. One is I'm going to, oops, I'm sorry. I'm going to modify. Um, the aggregate demand equation to say it's not only the safe rate of interest, i.e. the treasury rate, I'm adding a credit spread. So that's, think of that as like corporate bonds. Uh, so this is just a shorthand way of saying financial conditions matter, okay? And I'm adding, and this is kind of the important part, I'm adding what you might call a credit bites back term. Okay, this is sort of important, and I think you, you know, if you think about it, it's not insane. It's saying not only do the level of rates matter, but changes in rates matter. And one way to think about that is through sort of the financial intermediary sector. In other words, when rates go up, hold aside the level, when rates go up, that SVB, again, good example, that puts pressure, losses on, you know, banks lose money, that compromises their ability to lend, or bond funds see outflows, that compromises their ability to lend. So there's something in here that has to do with not the level of rates, but the change in rates. Okay, and then the second piece is that the, um, the central bank basically has an influence through reaching for yield on credit spreads. So the credit spread tends to go down when rates go down, okay? So I, I hope you don't think either of those two is like extremely unrealistic. Um, and let me go sort of do this in peace. Let's first do it without credit bites back, okay? If you set aside the term, the last term, I think you now have a model of how central banks talk about stuff. In other words, they talk about stuff not just through safe rates, but financial conditions. Right? It matters sort of broad. In that world, if it's just that, there's still no, there's no real problem for policy. You've got to nail financial conditions, put them in the right place, as opposed to just putting the safe rate in the right place. But once you've done that, there's no intertemporal trade-off. In other words, if, if credit spreads are a little narrower than they usually are, then you set rates a little higher. If there's an SVB kind of thing and credit is a little tight, you set rates a little lower, but you can still basically in this world hit, hit your target period by period. All right, where things get more interesting, oops, the wrong thing. Where things get more interesting is when there is this credit bites back effect. Now it can be hard, even in the absence of supply shocks, can be hard for the central bank to sort of nail everything period by period, and they might have to make a live trade-off. Okay, so the concrete thing to think about is imagine a world where we've had, there's two, two dates, one and two, and we've had a negative aggregate demand shock today, and there's the possibility that we'll have another negative aggregate demand shock tomorrow to the point where you could possibly hit the ZLB. The reason I say could possibly hit the ZLB, meaning that if you get into bad enough trouble, 
the central bank won't be able to bail you out. Okay? In that world, basically, you may not go all the way. It may be the optimal thing to not fully stabilize output today to leave yourself with a little dry powder in the future. Okay? The idea being, if you do everything you knew, need to do to fully offset the aggregate demand shock today, you will have overheated financial uh, markets to the point where there's enough of a bite back, bite back risk that you may not be able to fully offset tomorrow. So you may go a little bit easy today. You may accept some, some failure to fully hit a target today because you're playing a little bit for the future. Okay, so that's the trade-off. Um, I mean, to be clear, nothing I've said, even if you accept that there's a qualitative trade-off, haven't done anything yet in terms of helping you quantify it. If anything, at best, this is sort of suggesting an agenda for the kind of work that you might do to start filling in, uh, to filling in this model. You know, there's a sort of um, uh, euphemism about should, should central banks lean against the wind. I'm not super fond of that because that tends to have the feeling of like the wind is coming from outside. You know, there's a dot-com bubble. It's sort of investor sentiment. It's sort of exogenous. Should we deal with that? Maybe there the answer is no. But in this case, in the way I've set it up, the central bank is the wind. In other words, they're marshalling sort of this easing of financial conditions to get their job done. And the question is just how hard do you as the central bank want to kind of push uh, to do this? Um, oh, this is a quote I love from Don Cohn. I found this in the transcripts about uh, 18, 19 years ago, where when he talked about what they were doing in 2004, I won't read you the whole quote, but he said, well, you know, basically, what are we trying to do? We're trying to inflate asset prices to kind of goose the economy. Uh, this could get kind of risky, could go bad. Because, um, well, at the end of it, he says, well, in the end, let's, let's not worry about it too much. But the diagnosis was spot on. He said, we're using interest rates to kind of, you know, get guys to, to speculate a little bit harder, to create a bubble in housing prices, and that's our mechanism. Okay, so that's... That's kind of the story. And you can see there's the, the, the trade-off is sort of implicit in Don's, in Don's characterization, but sort of don't really know what quite to, to do with it. Um, so, you know, what do you do with all of this? Um, even if you accept pretty much everything I've said, I think this is pretty early stage stuff. This would be sort of interpreted as a call for more of the kind of research um, that would allow you to... Uh, to sort of make this operational. I was talking last night to Tobias Adrian from the IMF, and he and some of his co-authors are working on sort of an explicit, you know, quantitative macro model that has these sorts of effects in them, okay? So, you know, that would be the next step. And of course, one of the things that you will need is to actually have a summary measure in the same way that, you know, to, to do inflation output uh, trade-offs, you need to have an inflation forecast may not be great, but you, you need to have one. You're going to need to have some kind of a summary measure of financial conditions that is particularly good for capturing this kind of bite back, um, bite back risk. You know, so I know that you know, central banks, and this was true when I was at the Fed, produce very good, complete, and elaborate financial stability reports, often quite long. They look at a variety of markets, but don't necessarily always distill them to something, to a sort of simple metric that can become decision relevant. So if you're gonna do this, the next step is gonna be, you know, and of course it's gonna be imperfect, but it's to have something that is analogous in a way to an inflation forecast. It's gonna be a, a metric of this, this, sort of financial, um, this sort of financial risk. Uh, let me skip that. Again, um, many, many, many caveats. Having said that, I think, you know, here's, let me just leave you with sort of a qualitative uh, way of, th that I think about it. Um, you know, all of this is going to depend on how far you are from your target or from your mandate. So in other words, think on the one hand of the QE3 era. So at the time that Jay and I uh, first arrived at the Fed, the unemployment rate was about 8%. And, you know, uh, we, I was kind of worried about for some of the financial stability risks that QE might, um, might provoke. But of course, 8% unemployment is really bad. Right? I mean, through the lens of a quadratic loss function or just through any kind of sense, it's really bad. And even if you're taking risk, in fact, if you're not taking risk at that point, you're not trying hard enough. Okay? So you might say, yeah, I understand that there are these trade-offs, but boy, today is going to weigh a lot on the scale relative to whatever is down the road. Okay? So there I don't think we can do a model, but it would be a good sanity check for the model that it doesn't have you doing something dramatically different at that time. Contrast that with 
shortly before the pandemic broke out in late 2019 in the US, unemployment was 3.5%, the labor market was great. Um, you know, inflation was a little bit below target. It was 1.7, it wasn't two. If you were sort of very literal about getting to target, you might have said, well, we should be easing. And if the Phillips curve is pretty flat, getting from 1.7 to two could have involved quite a bit of incremental easing. You know, you might have to burn a lot of the furniture in the room. At that point, I would have said, you know what? The difference between 1.7 and two, not so big in welfare terms. So the today weighs less on the scale relative to the future and accepting 1.7 in order to kind of you know, safeguard financial stability may be a much better trade. Again, that's qualitative. In an ideal world, we'll get closer to the sort of modeling framework that'll allow us to do, to do better on, on that. So let me, let me stop there, I'm over time. Thanks, uh, thanks very much. Thank you.